We continue from where we left off the last time. We ended at chapter 11 the last time. After Parshurama has heard the story of Hemalekha and Hemachuda, he is still a little bit puzzled. The story of Hemalekha and Hemachuda revolved around the fact that it is really important to have satsang, to have the company of the wise. Yet, Parshurama is a little bit unclear about the nature of the universe and the Tatraya explains to him that the nature of the universe is illusory. This is all an illusion, but this illusion and everything is pure consciousness. It happens very often, especially among those teachers who are what I call neo advaitas In neo advaita they talk about everything being pure consciousness all the time, but it's an intellectual understanding. And what we try from a tantric perspective is to understand, yes, the world is illusory, but everything is consciousness, and therefore we need to learn to live in both the external world as well as the internal world. Having explained this to Parshurama, Parshurama still has some doubts and in the following chapter, next couple of chapters, Dattatraya will tell us the story of Mahasena and of this amazing world within the mountain. Amazing story. I hope you're going to enjoy it as, as much as I always enjoy it. So chapter 12 from Tripura Rahasya is called The Immense Powers of Yoga. After listening to the nature of the universe, as the Tatriya described it, Parshurama's mind was still filled with doubts. He asked, Lord, I have listened to your ideas about the universe. Whatever you say must be true. Nevertheless, I do not understand why this universe appears to be real. Why have so many wise people decided it does in fact exist? Why does this universe seem to be real though you say it is unreal? Kindly teach me how the universe is unreal by removing my doubts. The great sage then began to explain why the universe is mistaken as real. A brief comment here. What is very beautiful in this text, as well as all texts that are part of the wonderful Indian tradition, teaching tradition, where Mostly there are dialogues between teacher and student, whether we take the Bhagavad Gita or the different Upanishads, for example, the Mandukya Upanishad, a conversation between the teacher, Angiras, and the student, Shavnak, <clears throat> the Bhagavad Gita, which is a dialogue between Krishna and Arjun. Tripura Rahasya is a dialogue between Tathatreya and Vashurama. This is a wonderful tradition because it puts the questions in the mouth of the student that all students are asking. These are the doubts that all students have. Some students may not get around to finding a teacher to ask these questions, but these are quite well explained here. The answers and of course we need to supplement this with practice. But all the same, I find 
but these texts serve the students very well in providing these answers which address their doubts. <clears throat> the great sage then began to explain why the universe is mistaken as real. Listen, Parshurama, this illusion is ancient and rooted in ignorance, which causes one thing to be mistaken for another. The real self is ignored because one identifies oneself with the body. Here we find flesh, blood and bones on one side and pure consciousness, Atman, on the other. There is a vast difference between the perishable and imperishable. It is a deep-rooted habit of human beings to identify the body with consciousness. Consciousness is pure and unblemished. This universe also appears to be real because of identification. By changing one's deep-rooted habit of identifying the self with the body, this false concept must be removed. The universe will appear to be the way one believes it to be. The yogis, in their contemplation and meditation, identify themselves with Atman. So here, Dattatreya tells us the root of the problem. The root of the problem is that you have started identifying with the self, not with the self, but with the body. It's a false concept. It's a habit. It's a deep-rooted habit or avidya, ignorance. Ignorance is nothing but a habit. It starts, it's an ancient, ancient habit. And, of course, with every birth, this habit is strengthened. And we need to actively work to unlearn this habit. This habit is strengthened through the upbringing that most of us received, through the societies which also strengthen many of these habits. So those of us who want to speedily develop, we need to find active methods to unlearn, which is through daily regular practice. If you do not, then you will go through a process of evolution which may take thousands of lifetimes, even tens of thousands of lifetimes, before you begin to see the truth and begin to identify with the Atman instead of identifying with the body. Tatatreya tells a lovely and wonderful story to illustrate this. And so I continue reading from verse 11. In this regard, let me relate a wonderful story. In the country of Banga, there is a holy city named Sundarapura. There was a wise king named Susena. His younger brother, Mahasena, loved him very much. Susena ruled his kingdom righteously and was highly respected. <clears throat> One day, he decided to worship Lord Shiva through the Ashwamedha ceremony. His powerful sons, a huge army, accompanied the ritual horse. The princess defeated all the warriors who tried to capture the horse. So, the Aswamedha ceremony. Who knows what the Aswamedha ceremony is? It, it is briefly mentioned here.
So, does anybody know what the Ashwamedha ceremony or yagya is? Mm. Okay, I'll just very briefly tell you that in some hundreds or thousands of years ago, it was, it was not in the recent um, times, but at least um, in the um, scriptures, it's referred, it's referred to in many, like in the Mahabharata and many other stories, whether this is really historical or really true or not, is not very clear. But in this, in these stories, kings who aspired to become emperors and rule over other kings would perform the Asvamedha Yagya which was a kind of a sacrifice, a ritual, and with the ritual, there was a horse. The horse was then allowed to wander or go through different kingdoms. And behind the horse would be an entire army. The army, of course, belonged to that king who aspired to be the emperor. And... The kings who stopped the horse would have to fight that army. If they lost, they would submit to the king who aspired to be emperor. And if they won, of course, the aspiration of this king would come to an end. So the Asvamedha Yagna was a ceremony for a king who inspired, aspired to be the emperor. From a yogic perspective, a Samaya perspective, the Asvamedha ceremony or Yagya has a completely different meaning. To be an emperor means to have full control over the mind. From verse 14, His powerful sons and a huge army accompanied the ritual horse. The princes defeated all the warriors who tried to capture the horse. Following the horse, they arrived at the bank of the Iravati River. There they passed the hermitage of the sage Tangana. The arrogant soldiers ignored the sage and passed without paying homage to him. Tangana's son became enraged at this slight to his father. He captured the horse and the princes who were guarding the horse. The, ho the princes and their army surrounded the horse, but suddenly the young man took the animal, entered into the side of the rock-like mountain, while the princes watched in aston astonishment. When they saw the young ascetic entering the rock, they attacked it with their weapons and broke the rock. A young yogi emerged from behind the broken rock with a huge army and rapidly conquered the opposing army, captured this, the princes, took the army inside the rocky mountain. The soldiers who escaped reported to the king. Susena was amazed to hear this story and spoke to his younger brother. Mahasena, go to that hermitage where the sage Tangana recites, these yogis have immense powers. They cannot be defeated even by gods. Be humble, please the yogis, and bring back the horse and my sons. But it should be done immediately, so that the time of ritual does not pass. Do not be egotistical in front of the yogis. If they get angry... They can curse you and convert you into ashes with their yogic powers. Accomplish your mission respectfully so that our purpose will be fulfilled. Thus commanded by the king, Mahasena left for the ashram. So a brief comment here. It was very important for a king not to lose his horse, of course, uh, if the ceremony would be stopped, that means he would lose, he could not become emperor. Besides, this king has realized that 
the yogis have far greater powers and he instructed his brother accordingly. So what has happened is that this yogi, the son rather of the sage, has taken away the horse as well as a greater part of the army inside the mountain. So I continue from verse 28. There he saw the sage Tangana sitting in his hermitage, still in meditation. His body was still like a log of wood and steady like a wall. His senses and mind were tranquil. His ego was fully dissolved in the ocean of bliss. Mahasena prostrated in front of him with folded hands and started singing the praise of the sage. For three days he prayed to the sage with reverence. The son was pleased with this praise of his father. He approached Mahasena and said, I am pleased with the respect you have given my father. Tell me, how can I help you? I am the son of the sage, Tangana. My father is in deep samadhi and will come out after completing 12 years. Only five years have passed, so he has to complete another seven years. Whatever you desire, you will get. Do not think of me as a child. Like my father, I am also a yogi, and nothing is impossible for a yogi. Listening to the young yogi, the wise Mahasena paid homage with folded hands. O oh, young sage, if you really want to help me, I would like to see your father when he comes out of Samadhi. This is my earnest desire. If you think that I deserve your blessing, please fulfill this desire. The young yogi replied, O oh, prince, by no means will it be possible to fulfill your desire. However, I will do whatever I can for you. Wait for a moment and I will demonstrate my yogic power. At this moment, my father is established in perfect peace. Who can wake him up from deep samadhi? I will try to find a method that will bring him out of samadhi. He sat down and started to pay attention to the flow of his breath. In moments, he became motionless. With his one-pointed mind, he contacted the sage. That moment the sage opened his mind, his eyes, sorry. Calmly and cheerfully he said, Son, do not commit this mistake again. Anger is the enemy of meditation. It is customary for a, per for a king to always protect the yogis. Do not disturb the king's rituals. Therefore, be happy and return the horse immediately so that the time of the ceremony does not expire. Thus, he persuaded his son to immediately return the horse and the princess so that the ceremony could be performed at the appointed time. Calmed by his father and following his command, the young sage went into the hill of rock and returned with the horse and the princess and handed them over to Mahasena. Mahasena sent his king's men and the horse back to the capital. Then he once again paid homage to Tangana and respectfully inquired, Lord, I cannot understand how my nephews and the horse could live inside a rock. Please explain this to me. Tangana replied, Prince, listen to my story. Once upon a time, I myself was a king and ruled a country surrounded by the ocean. By the grace of the Supreme Being, I attained the knowledge of Tripura, the mother of the universe, whose nature is pure consciousness. After realizing the mystery of Tripura, the objects of the world lost their charm and value for me. Thus, disinterested in worldly activities, I turned over my kingdom to my sons and retired into this forest. My devoted wife accompanied me. For thousands of years I have done my austerities, 
while serving me, my wife also attained the highest goal of life. Once under the influence of some samskaras, the mind of my wife, who was ever devoted to me alone, became sexually aroused, but she was in meditation. She saw I was in deep meditation, but could not control her urge. She had a deepest, deep desire, became pregnant, and gave birth to a self-luminated sun. She woke me up and put the sun on my lap. Dropping her body, she left for her celestial abode. I saw this child in my lap and realized that my wife had died. I raised the child with great care and love. One day my son learned about my past and the way I had ruled a kingdom. He also wanted to be a king and requested me to help him. I initiated him into the science and philosophy of yoga. Following my instructions, he attained the highest yogic state. Then, through this Sankalp Shakti, the power of determination, he created a universe in this rock where he rules a continent surrounded by an ocean. It was to that world that he took your nephews and the horse he has just released. So, this is a very fascinating story where we find out the sage used to be a king and he gave up his kingdom and became a sage and performed austerities for thousands of years. What is this idea about thousands of years? We have seen that in scriptures again and again that sages, etc., yogis perform austerities for thousands of years. It is possible for disembodied beings to perform austerities or meditation or devotion, contemplation for what an embodied person would consider thousands of years. But at a disembodied plane of existence or consciousness, that time does not have much meaning. Which also explains why his wife had a desire and became pregnant and gave birth to a son. So, in the disembodied state, the desire you have is fulfilled. And that's the level of consciousness that is at a macrocosmic level. Just as in the microcosmic level, we, we talk about waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Similarly, there's a macrocosmic level where you have also the different levels of consciousness. And so, this cos macrocosmic level, one can have a deep desire and have a child. <clears throat> and now that this boy is also uh, has the desire to be a king, one way to fulfill the desires is in a meditative way is to have to let go of the desire and the other way is to fulfill the desire by living it out letting it manifest and here we're talking about living it out or manifesting at another level of consciousness so Shibu is referring to a story from the autobiography of a yogi where Mahatar Babaji created or manifested a palace 
so that the desire of Lahari Masa would be fulfilled because he desired, he had a little desire for a palace and riches. So now we have understood that his son has also got these powers and he rules the continent surrounded by ocean within this rock, this mountain rock. He has an entire, created a world inside, a universe in fact. So I continue from verse 66. In this way I have explained their imprisonment in the hill. Having listened to the sage, Mahasena asked, Further, I have heard this wonderful story from you personally. I want to see that wonderful place. Can you comply with my request? After Mahasena prayed to the sage, the sage ordered his son to show him all of his creation. Having thus instructed his son, the sage again went to the depths of Samadhi. Then the young yogi led Mahasena to the hill and entered it. But the prince could not follow. He called to the young yogi. From inside the hill, the young yogi called back to the prince, then came out again and said, You are not a yogi. That is why you are having difficulty entering the hill. Because you do not have yogic powers. This is difficult for you. Drop your gross, gross body in this hole. <clears throat> then you will have access. But the prince could not do so. The prince said, O oh, yogi, tell me how to consciously drop my body. I will die if I leave it forcefully. The young sage smilingly said, You do not know yoga science. Close your eyes. The prince gently closed his eyes and the young yogi entered his body and pulling the subtle body out, left the physical body in the pit. Then, using his yogic power, he entered the hill, taking the prince with it. Note, the yogi here demonstrates Parakaya Pravesh Vijnan. This is a rare technique known only by highly accomplished adepts. So, this technique of Parakaya Parakaya Pradesh is also mentioned in the Yoga Sutras and this is a technique to, for which you have to first learn to drop your own body and then also enter another person's body. And this is a technique that is only mastered by adepts. Jolted by this separation from his physical body, Mahasena's subtle body lost consciousness. The young sage united the prince's subtle body with a gross body. He materialized through his own Sankalp Shakti and the prince gained, regained consciousness. He realized the young sage was transporting him across a vast abyss. Above, below, and to all sides, he saw the infinite, bewildering space. Terrified, he cried, O oh, great sage, forsake me not. If I am lost in this limitless space, I will die. The young sage laughed at his fear and gave him courage. This is the world inside the hill. Look around fearlessly. Having regained his courage, Mahasena saw different planets in the distance, surrounded by darkness. He moved to that region of remote planets, looked down, saw a large moon. He moved to the moon. It clearly froze because the moon was so cold. Fortunately, the young sage protected him. Then moved to a planet where he found himself scorched by the rays of the sun. The young sage comforted him with the help of yogic power. All the planets seemed to him like reflections of paradise. Then he landed on the peaks of the Himalayas with the yogi. 
From there he could see all the sights the sage pointed out. For the yogi gave him powerful eyesight so that he could see continents at a great distance. He saw a ring-like mountain named Loka Loka. Beyond that was golden land. He also saw oceans, rivers, seven different continents covered with mountains, bright beings, demons, men, primitive tribes and semi-humans like Yakshas and Kinaras. He also saw the young sage himself residing in the form of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, living in Satyalok, Vaikund and Kailash, respectively. Mahasena also saw that. At the same time, the young sage had taken another form and was ruling the earth as its emperor. He was amazed by this great yogic power of the young sage. The young sage told him, O prince, twelve thousand years have passed since we have been visiting this world. Now we will return to the outside world where my father resides. So you see that in this world, in his universe that he has created within this hill, he, he, he has taken the form of Brahma, of Vishnu, of Shiva, of an emperor. And he has taken different forms and living out his desires. So this is another part of this yogic technique to manifest the desires. They take also different bodies to live them out. This is fast fructifying karma. And he says to him, 12,000 years have passed. Now please remember that the sense of time at this level of consciousness is different from the waking consciousness. Just as when you go to sleep at night, or wake up in the morning, it may seem like only a moment ago you fell asleep and now already eight hours have passed. I'm sure it has happened to most of you that Perhaps you were sitting one afternoon on a nice comfortable sofa, curled up reading a book, and you fell asleep. And you woke up and suddenly realized that two hours had passed. And it seemed like you only took a little short nap. And so it is that in sleeping consciousness, we have a different sense of time. And just in the same way, this level of consciousness that the young sage is talking about or showing him around, 12 years, 12,000 years have passed. But it seemed just a short few moments. Having said this, he returned to the world with the prince. He came out of the hill as he had entered. Chapter 13. The young yogi imparts the knowledge of Atman to the grieving Mahasena. After coming out of the hill, the young sage made the prince's subtle body unconscious, drew it out of the body he had materialized for him, and united it with his original physical body. Then he restored his awareness to the former world. After awakening, Mahasena saw his former world and was surprised to see that the earth, men, trees, streams and lakes were in completely different forms. He asked, O oh, great one, what is this new world you are showing me now? Here is still another universe. How wonderful it is! The young yogi replied, O oh, prince, this is the same country where we lived before. A long time has passed. That is why it seems fresh and new. We spent one day in the world which exists inside the rock. While here in the outside world, 12,000 years have passed. That is why this world seems different. There are differences in the way people live and their behavior. Their languages are totally different. People go through such changes with the passage of time. I have seen this sort of thing many times. So obviously the young prince is used to going between these different worlds and is used to these changes. So for him it didn't seem very important. 
Have some of you seen the movie Interstellar? Well, apparently no one. I know you're him, I see that. <clears throat> well, Rajesh, maybe it's time that you see it. Yeah, it's a very interesting movie because in this movie they, they land on a planet which has a completely different sense of time, gravity. So when they land there and they spend a day um, and they return to their spaceship, 25 years have passed. And this is the principle which is really uh, the law, one of the laws of physics. There's a different sense of time on planets which have heavier gravity. And so that particular planet was a... Mm, um, it wasn't a black hole, Joachim, that, the, that was the other one. It was very close to a black hole, and so this planet came in the field of the black hole, the gravitational field, and therefore it has a, had a different uh, sense of time there. And these are some of the laws of physics. So, a very interesting movie, and... Uh, It uh, makes you very contemplative. I would say it's uh, almost a yogic movie. So the young sage continues, See right over there, my almighty father is still in Samadhi. This is the very place where you praised him with great honor. In front of you is the huge rock which we entered. Inside that rock you saw a new world created through yogic powers. During that period, thousands of years have passed. In your country of Banga, where the beautiful capital Sundarapura existed, there is a thick, huge forest where jackals and other animals live. Virabahu comes from your father's lineage. His capital, Vishala, in the state of Malava, is situated on the banks, bank of the Sipra River. There is another king, Susharma, descended from him, who rules the Dravida country, living in the city of Vardhana, near Tamraparni River. <laughs> Such is the state of the world, which is ever-changing. In a few moments... Completely new world appears. After many, many years, these mountains, rivers, lakes, and the earth itself will change. Change is the habit of the world. Lowlands rise, mountains crumble into pits, deserts become tropical, rocky land becomes sandy, and sandy land turns rocky. Infertile land becomes fertile, lush land infertile. Gems turn into pebbles and pebbles into precious gems. Fresh water becomes salty and salt water sweet. Countries inhabited by men become havens for animals. There was a time when the earth was inhabited primarily by insects and worms. Thus in the course of time the world changes. These changes occur on earth in the course of time. In fact, the earth remains the same. Deeply grieved, Mahasena fainted. Revived by the yogi, he plunged into grief and started mourning for his wife, brother and children. The young sage consoled him with his wisdom. O oh, prince, you are a brilliant man. Why do you mourn? So you see, this is 
what has happened 12,000 years have passed and he explains how the world is constantly changing. We just have to look back at the changes which have happened in our own world, maybe just in the last five years. And you think about the technologies that have become available. Five years ago, seven years ago, things like Facebook and YouTube were not as popular as they are today. Not everybody had mobile phones. And today, almost everybody has mobile phones. People are well connected and using these all the time. This has changed the world. If you see geographically, also, constantly things are changing. Everything is changing constantly. Northern Africa, which is a desert today, the Sahara, used to be a jungle at one point of time. So the Himalayas didn't exist. There was ocean there at that time, thousands and thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, and now... These are the highest mountains in the world. So there is constant change happening. And we cannot stop this march of time. So, the young yogi says, Why do you moan? A wise man never does anything without a purpose. One who performs an action without knowing its consequence, is a fool. Now tell me the cause of your grief and how it will serve you. Mahasena replied with great anguish, O oh, Sage, can you not see the cause of my grief? Even knowing that I have just lost everything, you are asking this question? A person who loses just one family member is overcome with grief. But I have lost my whole family and my kingdom. And still you are asking why I am sad? The sage, laughing, asked, Prince, is it your family tradition to believe that if you do not grieve, a great misfortune will befall you? Do you think that by lamenting, those lost things will be regained? Have courage and know that by grieving, nothing is achieved. If you think it is necessary to grieve for lost relatives, then you should continue grieving your whole life for your grandfather and many other older relatives who have died. Why do you not express your grief for them also? Whose relatives were they actually? How did they become your relatives? In your parents' stool and even in your own, there are millions of worms. They are also born from and related to your body. Why do you not consider them your relatives and grieve for them also? Prince, remember who you really are. Why this sorrow? Are you the body or are you different from it? The body is composed of many elements. That which is called destruction, is it of all parts or just one part? Parts of the body are being destroyed at every moment. For example, urine, feces, mucus, hair and nails are being excreted continually while the body still exists. Earth, water and other elements are the constituents of your brother's physical body. These elements still exist. You are not actually the body though you have a body. Just as you say that these are my garments, you also say this is my body. Can you explain how you and the body are one and the same? They are not. Don't have doubt regarding this. What relationship do you establish between yourself and another body? Do you ever find yourself attached to your brother's garments? Why then mourn for the dead, which are exactly like garments? Prince, tell me, when you refer to my body, my senses, my prana, my mind, can you tell me who you are? 
So this was the, the teachings of the young sage. Having lost everything that he possessed, including his family, he faints. It's so deep, this attachment, that when suddenly everything is lost, we are in total anguish and unable to take this, you faint. The yogi is talking about the body in a sense that it is a garment, just like the clothes we wear. For most of you, this is not new philosophy or new way of thinking. You have heard this before from the Bhagavad Gita, from other Vedantic texts. But a word of caution or advice here. While this sounds wonderful and exciting, if it's new, and if not, you think, oh my, I know all this, I, I've heard this before. But there's a difference between reading and knowing through direct experience. So, it's important that we do not start referring to our body as something that does not belong to us until that has actually become a direct experience. Otherwise, it becomes a kind of hypocrisy because you, start, you, you keep talking in this funny way where you say, oh, I'm not my body and, I'm <laughs> and my body is, going, is like my, my clothes or my garments. And it's... What I've noticed is that people who do that without a deeper understanding of it they get lost in their own intellectual world. So, Survi writes into Stella. I, I don't know if that's a question. If that's uh, written there into Stella as a kind of posing a question, yes, that's what the movie is called. And... Yes, so this is some Advaitic philosophy here. And, but it is to be understood in a tantric concept or framework and in the tantric, within the tantric framework, the importance is stressed on direct experience. So the young yogi has asked Mahasena, can you tell me who you are? Mahasena started pondering this puzzle. He wanted to solve it. And when he could not find the answer, he again became sad and humbly said, Lord, I do not really know who I am. Without knowing the exact reason, out of habit, I am feeling sad. I am helpless. I surrender myself at your feet. Lord, what is the secret? When someone dies, his relatives grieve. They do not know their essential nature, yet they grieve. Lord, I submit myself to you. Please accept me as your disciple. Please explain this whole thing to me. Hearing this, the sage's son spoke. Listen, Mahasena. People deluded by the illusory power of the great goddess do not realize their essential nature and grieve uselessly. As long as they do not realize the Atman, they are overcome by sorrow. After realizing one, after realization, one no longer grieves. Just as one dreams, just as one forgets his dream identity and concerns when he awakens. After the dreamer awakens or an audience understands how a trick was performed, their reaction to the dream or illusion disappears. In fact, they laugh at themselves for having been deluded. Likewise, a person who has realized the self across the mire of delusion feels compassion for pitiful people like you. 
After realizing the self, one can cross the ocean of sorrow. O oh, Maji Prince, realize the Atman and cast off the sorrow created by delusions. Mahasena said, Lord, the example of dreams and magic does not seem appropriate. The objects created in a dream or through magic simply appear and do not serve any purpose. But objects of the waking state seem to be real and useful. They are perfectly tangible, not unreal. How can they be the same as dream objects? The young yogi responded, Prince, listen, what you said about my example not fitting is another example of misunderstanding. You are as doubly confused as a person confused in a dream. A dream tree serves the purpose in the dream. Is it possible for travelers to rest under the tree? As dreamers are satisfied during dreaming, those who are awake cannot enjoy the fruits of their dreams. Does not the fruit of that tree satisfy the dreamer? As you, if you say that dream objects lose their existence the moment the person awakens, wait. Is it not also true that objects responding to the waking state vanish in deep sleep? If you claim that when you awake, when you wake up, the objects that were there yesterday are still there today, then tell me if this is if it is not true that dream objects can also be re-experienced. If you say that in a dream there is no recurrence of dream experience and consequently the objects of the dream are unreal, then listen. Where is the recurrence of a given object in the waking state? Since objects in the waking state also change. Are you suggesting that the mountains, ocean and earth, all these forms which we see really exist permanently? They are constantly changing. Dream world experiences are similar. In dreams, the mountains, the rivers, earth, friends, relatives are experienced exactly the way they are experienced in the waking state. Mountains and other objects of the world also change if you see them again. How can they be real? In summer there are no waterfalls, but in the rainy season they appear. Similarly, animals, insects, thunder, clouds, lightning and storms constantly change. Similar changes occur on the earth and in the ocean. Even the oceans are changing. I am telling you, try to think at a more subtle level. Objects in both dreaming and waking states are constantly subject to change. However, in practical life, there is obviously some difference. In the waking state, objects experienced are similar to the objects experienced in the dreaming state. Their fundamental continuity cannot be ignored. If you consider dreams illusory, I want to know what illusion is. Illusion depends on the appearance and disappearance of objects from our senses. Everything vanishes in deep sleep. Those who do not have clear insight to the nature of the objects cannot prove the validity of any object because of their distorted minds. This world is similar to the world experienced in the dream state. Dreams can also be prolonged. As long as the dream persists, its objects appear real. They serve the intended purpose of the dream, appear perfectly stable. Objects in the external world corresponding to the waking state have the same property. Just as a person is aware of the waking state when he is awake, the same way in the dream state he is aware of the dream objects. Prince, if the waking and dreaming states are similar, why does one not mourn for relatives lost in the dreaming state? So you understand that what is happening is this kind of discussion which is based on a certain amount of logic and observation 
about the waking and dream states. So, the yogi poses certain questions. The answer is, of course, evident that just as when you go to sleep, the waking state disappears, similarly, when you wake up, the dream state disappears. So the objects which existed in the dream state are gone when you wake up. The objects in the waking state are gone when you sleep. Why do you not mourn every time when you go to sleep? Why do you not mourn every time you wake up? Both are, in fact, illusions. There is a wonderful story about a king who was sitting at the bedside of his dying son. The emperor was sitting with his wife, the empress, and their son, their only son, the heir to his vast empire, was dying. As you can imagine, this old emperor was very sad. They were waiting, and while he was waiting, he was very tired. He fell asleep. In his dream, he dreamt that he had 12 sons, and they went to war. And all the 12 sons died in the war, in the battle. Just at that moment, his wife, the empress, cried out in great sorrow because their only son had now died. The emperor jerks out of his dream and realizes his only son is dead. And he's confused. And he asks his wife and says to her, I do not know whom I should mourn for, for my one son who has died now, or for the twelve sons who died in my dream, because both were so real. So which one was real and which one is an illusion? Because both gave him a great, great deal of pain. He didn't know which one he should cry for. So, coming back to this question, if the waking and dream states are similar, why does one not mourn for relatives lost in the dreaming state? The reality of the external world is a projection of one's mind. If someone thinks it is unreal, then for that person, this universe certainly becomes unreal. We have promoted the idea that this universe is real because we have not even considered the other alternative. Prince, after realizing Atman, you will know that everything I am saying is true. The world you just experienced is an example of my statements. You want to experience it again. Let us go to the hill once more and circumambulate it. The son of the sage took the prince around the huge rocky hill, saying, Prince, this whole rocky hill is just one mile round, but you saw the entire universe in it. Was it false or true? Was it a dream or was it real? One day in the world, inside this rock is experienced as 12,000 years outside. Now decide which universe is more real. Like two different dreams, you cannot explain one in terms of the other. The obvious conclusion is that the whole universe is one's own imagination. Without this imagination, it would disappear instantly. Therefore, console yourself. The world is like a dream. Do not mourn the death, death of your brother. The mind is like a canvas on which the various objects of the universe appear to be painted. Those objects are similar, like images seen in the mirror. 
So be free from depression caused by the death of relatives in the dreaming state. O Prince, realize that the self is manifesting itself in the world. The self is pure and supreme consciousness. Realize this, experience the happiness within. Thus ends chapter 13, in which the simile of the interior of the mountain is explained from the yogic viewpoint. So we see that waking dreaming states are in fact both illusory. And because we have been trained to think this is real, we think it's real. If we would have been raised to believe everything is unreal, then we would act accordingly. So it's a good place to stop. I would like to remind you once again that the online session, the Tripura Rahasya online meeting on the 27th of October stands cancelled because of a retreat that we have. Alright, any comments or questions before we end? Okay, thank you Shibu. I'm happy that you are happy. <laughs> Bye, Manisha. Bye-bye, Rajesh. Bye, Debbie.